Hello, everybody. In this video lecture, we will continue covering um, introductory chapter, and we will talk about language of anatomy and about uh, body cavities, uh, some membranes that cover these body cavities. Um, as always, I will use our PowerPoint to help myself. So this is a PowerPoint that I'm using. And uh, you can see um, this is still our chapter one, introduction to the human body. And you can find this PowerPoint on Canvas. Um, and this is where we stopped, right here. So let's go ahead and begin. I will pick up my pointer. Um, bodies, organ system, and their major functions. Now, we already mentioned that uh, your body is made of 11 body systems. So one of them is integumentary system. Integumentary system includes skin as your organ. Skin is organ of the integumentary system. It also includes hair and nails and uh, some glands, exocrine glands. So integumentary system forms the external body covering and protects deeper tissues from injury. Also, integumentary system synthesizes vitamin D. It's actually synthesized the precursor of vitamin D. Vitamin D is important in calcium absorption. So if you eat um, food rich in calcium, or even if you take calcium uh, as a supplement to your diet, uh, you need calcium to move from your GI tract, from your digestive system, into your blood, right? And from your blood, then it will be distributed through your body and it will be stored in your bones. But you cannot absorb calcium without vitamin D. Right, and to synthesize vitamin D, you need your skin. Also, skin houses cutaneous uh, receptors. Um, your skin is cutaneous membrane. That's why we call those receptors cutaneous receptors, because they are located within your skin. And those are receptors for pain and pressure. Also, your skin um, houses sweat and oil glands. Another two body systems here are skeletal and muscular system. So skeletal system protects and supports body organs and provides a framework for muscles that are for muscle use to cause movement. So you move because of your uh, muscular system, skeletal system, and nervous system. Also, your skeletal system forms blood cells, both red blood cells and white blood cells, plus your bones store minerals. Now, how your bones protect you? Well, you have many cavities, well, not many, but several cavities that are protected by bony structure. Example would be your cranial cavity. So cranial cavity protects your brain. Vertebral cavity protects your spinal cord. Even your pelvic organs are protected by the pelvis. Uh, your thoracic organs, like your heart, your lungs, are protected by the uh, thoracic cage or rib cage. So that's a protection. Muscular system allows manipulation of the environment, uh, locomotion, facial expression, also, muscular system uh, maintains pressure and produces heat. Another two systems over here are nervous system and endocrine system. Those system of regulation and control. So nervous system is a fast acting control system of the body. It responds to internal and external changes by activating appropriate muscles and glands. So nervous system uh, is very specific and it's very fast, but it's short lasting. So let's say if you touching uh, some hot surface, 
right? Uh, you're gonna remove your hand from this stimulus, from this heat, and that would be uh, because of your nervous system. So you're gonna act very fast. You only gonna mo move your uh, hand away, and in a couple seconds, you're done with this movement, right? So that's why nervous system is fast acting, specific, and short lived. Endocrine system is also a system of control, uh, but it uses glands that secrete hormones, and those hormones regulate uh, growth, reproduction, metabolism of the body. Endocrine system also will respond to the stimulus, but it's not going to be that specific as the nervous system. Um, endocrine system just releases those hormones in your blood, and hormones travel through all your body and some organs will respond, some will not. So it's not specific. It's long lasting because those hormones will stay in your bloodstream for a while. Uh, and, uh, and it's really slow. It's not that fast. So two systems of control, nervous and endocrine. Another two system over here, cardiovascular and lymphatic or immune. So cardiovascular system um, include your heart and your blood vessels. Blood vessels transport blood, which carry oxygen, carbon dioxide, nutrients, waste, etc. For example, your hormones, endocrine hormones are also um, carried by blood. The heart pumps blood. Lymphatic system picks up fluid that is leaked from blood vessels, from your capillaries, and then return these fluids back to your um, venous system, back to your blood. Also, it um, houses the white blood cells that involve in immunity. Uh, and the immune response mounts the attack against foreign substances within the body. So you probably already knew that you have one circulatory system. And when I say circulatory system, everybody thinks about cardiovascular system. And that's correct. Cardiovascular system is circulatory system. It is two-way system. Blood flows away from the heart to your cells, to your tissues, and then back from cells and tissue back to the heart. So it's like two-way system, away and towards the heart. But we do have another circulatory system. It's a lymphatic system. A lymphatic system doesn't have a pump. So there is no special organ that pump the lymph. And lymphatic is one-way system. The fluids flow from your tissues to, towards the heart. And it also has different organs as any body system is. The biggest organ of lymphatic system is spleen. So it's right here. Um, respiratory and digestive systems. Respiratory system keeps blood constantly supplied with oxygen and removes carbon dioxide. The exchange uh, of gases occurs within the walls in the air sacs of the lungs. Digestive system breaks down food into absorbable units that we call nutrients. And those nutrients enter the blood for distribution to body cells. Indigestible foodstuff are eliminated as feces. So respiratory system supply you with oxygen, digestive system supply you with nutrients, and both the system remove of whatever you cannot uh, either digest, like food residues, or waste product, metabolic waste product, like carbon dioxide. Urinary system. Urinary system, another name is uh, excretory system. It eliminates nitrogenous waste from the body. It regulates your water, electrolyte, and acid-base balance in the blood. Reproductive systems. So we have male reproductive system and female reproductive system. 
overall function is producing of offsprings. Testes produce sperm and male sex hormones. And ovaries produce ova and female sex hormones. Um, what would be example of male sex hormones? Uh, testosterone, female sex hormones, estrogen, progesterone. So we have a primary organ such as ovaries, ovaries over here, and testes. But we also have the system of ducts and glands that, um, you know, in the male, they deliver sperm towards the female reproductive tract, right? And uh, in the female, those ducts, one of them are uterus, actually, they are, can be um, side of the development, fallopian tubes are side of fertilization. So they have uh, this supporting function in reproduction. Also, females have mammary glands and they produce milk to nourish the newborn. Okay, so that's, that's our 11 body systems. Now, anatomical terms. Um, before we start applying any anatomical terms, we need to be familiar with standard anatomical position. And this lady over here shows us how this position look like. So body erect, feet slightly apart, palms facing forward, and thumbs pointing away from the body. Uh, so directional term describe one body structure in relation to another body structure. And direction is always based on standard anatomical position. Right and left refer to your patient, to the body view, not to you, not the observer. So when you in anatomy, right, let's go back over here. In anatomy, well, right now this lady is standing up, but even if she lay down or she get on her, you know, upside down, get on her head, when we describe her body, we need to refer to this anatomical position. And when I'm talking about right and left, I always talking about her, my patient, right and left. So obviously that's going to be right and this will be left. Okay, so now uh, directional terms, they always um, come in pairs, right? So over here, superior, inferior. So superior is towards the head or upper part of the body. Inferior is away from head towards the low part of the body. For example, head is superior to the abdomen. The navel is inferior to chin, right? Uh, superior and inferior referred to your body trunk. We do not use this terminology when we're talking about arms and legs, right? So it's only for your axial part of your body. Anterior is the same as ventral in bipedal organism, the ones that use two uh, legs to walk, so for humans. Anterior is the same as ventral, and it's towards of the front of the body. Posterior, the same as dorsal, is towards or at the back of the body. So breastbone or your sternum is anterior to the spine, and heart is posterior to the breastbone or sternum. Um, another pair of directional terms is medial and lateral. So medial is towards the midline of the body and lateral is away from midline. So the heart is medial to the arms and arms are lateral to the chest. Intermediate is between a more medial and more lateral structure. Let's say collarbone is intermediate between the breastbone and the shoulder. Proximal and distal. Now, proximal and distal, distal is referred to arms and legs, right? So when we're talking about trunk, we're using superior, inferior. 
when we're talking about arms and legs, we're using proximal. Proximal means close to the body attachment or distal. Distal, farther away from the body attachment. So example, elbow is proximal to the wrist, right? Because your elbow is closer to your trunk and wrist is kind of like further away from the trunk. Knee is distal to the thigh. And of course, for both arms, legs, and for torso, we can use uh, anterior and posterior. Now, superficial and deep. Superficial is towards the body surface, and deep means away from body surface. So superficial would be skin is superficial to the skeletal muscles, and skeletal muscles are superficial to the bones. And uh, deep would be lungs are deep to the skin, or skeletal muscles are deep to your skin as well right so they always comes in pairs because you need two structures to compare them when you're using these directional terms uh, regional terms uh, two major divisions of body axial and appendicular um, part of your body so axial include head neck and trunk and appendicular include your legs and arms or limbs Regional terms designate specific areas within body divisions. So we have two body divisions, and then we have regional terms within these divisions. So here you're looking at the gentleman. Uh, he is in anatomical position. Even I would say like his legs are a little bit too far apart, um, but that's very close to anatomical position, and we're looking at anterior or ventral view. And here's our regional terms. So in the cervical region, we have frontal, right, or your forehead, orbital, eye region, nasal, oral, and your chin is mental. Then we have cervical region. Then we have thoracic region, shown here kind of in a orange color. And in the thoracic region, we have sternal, mammary, and axillary. Axillary is your armpit. Now we're moving to this uh, purple region that is abdominal. And within abdominal region, we have umbilical. Now we're moving to pelvic region. And within pelvic region, we have pubic or inguinal or groin. So inguinal is kind of like this area over here and over here. Now, when we're looking at the upper limb, that's upper limb, we have acromial, right, this point. Then we have brachial. We have this one, anti-brachial. Anti means before. So we have brachial here, and before we have anti-brachial. Now, here in the middle, uh, we have anti-cubital. So we have it before cubital. Then what is cubital? Cubital is a vein over here. It's called median cubital vein. Very common site of blood draw. So um, when we go for blood tests, they draw our blood very often from this median cubital. So the area is anti-cubital. Now we have this uh, carpal or your wrist and manus is a hand. This is where the manual work came from. Manual work is something that you're doing with your hands. So manus is a hand. And here we have palmar, we have digital, those are your fingers and polex, polex is your thumb. Now on your lower limb, we have this region that is coxal, femoral, patellar. Now this region over here is called crural. That's a crural. And on the side, this lateral side is fibula or uh, peroneal. Uh, fibula, because you have a bone over here, it's called fibula. And peroneal, because oh, you have a muscle here, it used to be called Peronium uh, longus, but now it's called fibularis longus. 
So fibula or peroneal. And now pedal or foot. We have tarsal or ankle. We have metatarsal. We have digital and hallux. That's a big toe, hallux. Okay, now if you're looking at the posterior side, some of these uh, terms will be the same, some will be different. But here's our cephalic region, and we have otic, that's your ear, occipital, that's the back of the head, cervical. So cervical, we have anterior cervical and posterior cervical. Now back, we have scapular, vertebral, lumbar, sacral, uh, gluteal, and perineal. Perineal is the area between anus and external genitalia. Now, in the upper limb, we have acromial, the same we, we saw on anterior view, brachial, the same, so that's a posterior brachial, posterior antibrachial, but over here we have alacrinal. That's alacrinal. Now we have a metacarpal, digital, right? And that's your manus. And, and pollux, of course, right? On the low limb, we have femoral, posterior femoral. We have popliteal. We have sural. We have fibula or peroneal. And in the pedal area, we have calcineal and plantar. Well, so you guys need to study those regional terms because entering this field, a medical field that many of you are planning to, that's going to be your new language now. So spend time to study all this regional terminology. Now, body plates. Body planes are imaginary planes that uh, actually can be cut or anatomy. Well, they can cut your body or somebody's body for anatomical study. Three most common planes are sagittal, frontal or coronal, and transverse or horizontal. Now look, those planes, they make cuts. Cuts are named based on the plane. So sagittal plane make a sagittal cut. Frontal plane make a frontal cut. Transverse plane make a transverse cut. Now when you make those cuts, then you produce sections. And sections have the same name. So, um, well, might be a little bit different because we have uh, sagittal and parasagittal section. But you can have sagittal section, frontal or coronal section, and transverse, horizontal, or cross section. This, this one has three names. <clears throat> okay, so here's our sagittal plane. So sagittal plane, if sagittal plane divides body right in the middle, then it produces sagittal section, and we call it mid-sagittal. Um, the sagittal plane can divide your body off-center, not on the middle. Then it will be parasagittal cut and parasagittal section. Right, so if we go back, you see this is a sagittal, but this is mid-sagittal. Now, mid-sagittal will divide your body into right and left, right? That makes sense. But if we have parasagittal, it's also divide parts into right part and left part. It's just not going through the midline of the body. Now, frontal or coronal plane, it makes this frontal or coronal cut, and it produces frontal or coronal section. And this divides your body into front and back. Transverse or horizontal plane makes transverse or horizontal cut, and it produce, you see it says here cross section, but it will be correct to call it transverse section or horizontal section. It just cross section is more common, right? And transverse plane divide your body into superior and inferior. Oblique section results of cut at angle other than 90 degree to vertical plane. So let's go back over here. Right, so this is our transverse 
shown here in green. So you have superior and inferior. That's your coronal shown in blue. So you have anterior and posterior. And sagittal, you have right and left. And anything that goes at angle will be oblique. Oblique plane, oblique cut, and oblique section. Okay, so, and of course, we do not cut patients with those planes, but we use our um, imaging technique, and those imaging technique can show body parts using these different um, sections. Now, body cavities and membranes. So, body contains internal cavities that are close to environment. So actually you have closed body cavities and you have open body cavities. So, uh, and it does make sense if they are close to environment, we call them closed body cavities. Um, so why do we need those body cavities? Well, first we need a room to keep our organs inside, right? So if you only have muscles and skin and bones, where would you put the heart, liver, intestine, brain, right? So those cavity to provide room for internal organs. And those cavities are to provide protection to those organs. Now, cavities can be divided into dorsal body cavity and ventral body cavity. So over here shown in yellow is dorsal body cavity and it includes cranial cavity and vertebral cavity. What is inside cranial cavity? The brain. Inside the vertebral cavity, spinal cord. And ventral body cavities, right? So ventral body cavities, they include um, bigger cavities and then we divide them into smaller ones. Well, two bigger are thoracic, so that's a thoracic cavity, and abdominal pelvic. Now, thoracic cavity is separated from abdominal cavity by diaphragm. Diaphragm is a skeletal muscle. Now, thoracic cavity is divided into smaller cavities. Two plural cavities, right plural cavity, left. And this is where lungs are located. Then this cavity in the middle is called pericardial cavity. And on the top is superior mediastinum. But it doesn't say over here, but superior mediastinum and pericardial cavity together, they make mediastinum. So what is mediastinum? Mediastinum is a um, region in your body behind the sternum. And mediastinum includes superior mediastinum and pericardial cavity. Uh, now, abdominal pelvic cavity can be divided into abdominal cavity, and this contains digestive viscera, and pelvic cavity that contains urinary bladder, reproductive organs, and rectum. Okay, so, well, now it's pretty much what we just covered, right? So that's our dorsal body cavity, ventral body cavity, Right, and, uh, and this is all the division that I just talked about, right? Now, um, something else I wanted to tell you. Yeah, so abdominal pelvic cavity contains stomach, intestine, spleen, liver. Pelvic cavity contains urinary bladder, reproductive organ, and rectum. Now, some um, clinical uh, application, homeostatic imbalances. Now, um, what it's about, if you look at your cavities and you ask yourself, which organs are most protected in my body, right? So imagine that aliens came to this planet and they know nothing about human anatomy, but they just looked at, you know, this mannequin and what they see? Well, they see there is a cavity over here, right? Cranial cavity. And there is the um, vertebral cavity that is really like fully protected by bones. And what aliens would think, oh, must be some important organs inside. And that's true. 
your brain and your spinal cord are the most protected organs. Um, the next protected area is actually your thoracic area because it's protected by the rib cage. And, uh, but you see, we have spaces in between your ribs, so it's not as much protected as your skull or your cranium, but that allow you some flexibility. And can you imagine if you had like complete bone over here, uh, your body would be very heavy. Next protected area is actually pelvic cavity because pelvic organs are protected by the pelvis. The least protected area is your abdominal cavity, right? And, and this is what it says. Uh, pelvic bones provide limited protection to the pelvic cavity. However, abdominal cavity is not protected by bones at all. It's only protected by muscles. So organs in this area are most vulnerable to trauma. But again, it gives us uh, the uh, less protection, but more mobility and flexibility. Okay. Another important thing about those cavities, when we're talking about ventral body cavities, thoracic and abdominal pelvic, uh, organs inside those cavities are called viscera. So viscera are organs that are located inside the ventral body cavity. And those organs and those cavities are covered by membrane. And this membrane is called serous membrane or serosa. And what serosa does, it secretes a serous fluid. And this is for lubrication and for a reduction of the friction and for protection, right? So serosa is a serous membrane and it's found only in closed ventral body cavities. Now, uh, to understand how a serous membrane um, is built, um, here's the analogy. So if you have a balloon and you're going to put a wrist inside the balloon, right? So what's going to happen? First, uh, one wall of the balloon will cover your skin, right? So it's outer, um, okay, inner, inner balloon wall, right? It covers your wrist. And then you have outer balloon wall. So that's like double, double layers, right? Two layers. And what is between them? Air. So you have balloon wall, you have air, and you have outer balloon wall, right? Now, if you compare it with your viscera, that are your organs, let's say your heart. Your heart also covered by this serous membrane and the, the membrane that cover your heart is called visceral serosa because your heart is your viscera. So visceral serosa. Now we do have space. It's called a visceral space, but of course we don't have air. We have serous fluid in this space. So it's a space and then we have outer serosa that is called parietal serosa, right? And this is covers the cavity. So it makes sense. So we have uh, serosa that is thin double layered membrane that covers surface in internal body cavities. And serosa has always two layers and they are separated by cavity filled with serous fluid and fluid secreted by both layers of the membrane, parietal serosa and visceral serosa. Now, because this serous membrane is found in a different cavities, right? It's found in the uh, thoracic cavity, right? In the pleural cavity, in abdominal cavity, it has different names. Now, serous membrane in, that cover your heart, and the um, cavity where the heart is located is called pericardium. So pericardium covers the heart and the pericardial cavity. So we have visceral pericardium and parietal pericardium. Now serous membrane covering your lungs, right over here, and the cavity where lungs are located is called pleura. 
So pleura cover lungs. So we have visceral pleura covering lungs and parietal pleura covering the pleural cavity. And your internal organ in abdominal pelvic cavity are covered by serous membrane that is called peritoneum. So we also have visceral peritoneum, peritoneum, and parietal peritoneum. It does make sense, right? So look, we have this serous membrane. Where is it found? In the ventral body cavity. Uh, what does it cover? It covers your organs and it covers the cavities within which organs are located. So serosa always have two layers, visceral serosa and parietal serosa. What is between them? Between them is cavity. And inside this cavity is serous fluid. Now serosa covering the heart is called pericardium, specifically visceral pericardium. Serosa that cover lungs is called pleura, specifically visceral pleura. And serosa that cover, let's say, your liver or your intestine, that serosa is called peritoneum. And we have visceral peritoneum and parietal peritoneum. Here's some clinical application. Serous membrane can become inflamed as a result of infection or some other causes. So normally smooth layers can become rough and even can stick together, resulting in excruciating pain. Um, an example would be um, pleurisy and peritonitis. So pleurisy is inflammation of pleura. So here you can see uh, lungs, that's normal lungs. So lungs are covered by visceral pleura um, the cavity is covered by parietal pleura. But if you have inflammation over here, that's what pleurisy is. Here you also see this uh, pneumothorax when we have air in between, uh, in the pleural cavity, between visceral and parietal pleura. Right. So that's an inflammation of serous membrane. And peritonitis would be inflammation of the serous membrane in your uh, abdominal cavity and abdominal pelvic cavity. Now, abdominal pelvic quadrants and regions. So quadrants are divisions used primarily by medical personnel. So four quadrants are used in the uh, medical field. Abdominal pelvic region is sectioned into four quadrants and names are really easy. So it's a right upper quadrant, left upper quadrant, right lower quadrant, left lower quadrant, or RUQ, uh, LUQ, RLQ, LLQ. And you can see that different organs are located into different quadrants. So liver, most of the liver in the uh, RUQ, um, gallbladder, most of the stomach in the left upper quadrant. Now this little guy over here is called appendix. So appendix is located in the right lower quadrant. This part over here is called cecum. Cecum is the first part of large intestine, so it's also in the right lower quadrant. Urinary bladder, however, in between um, two quadrants, right and left lower quadrants. Um, now in anatomy, we like to make things more complicated. So we use regions instead of quadrants and we have nine regions right over here. And look at their names. So let's start with easy one. This is umbilical region. That's good, right? Right lumbar, left lumbar, also easy to remember. Right iliac or right inguinal, left iliac or left inguinal. Now this one is called right hypochondriac. Hypochondriac means above the uh, cartilage. Oh, well, because we have this some uh, floating ribs over here, so that's why they called it hypochondriac. This is left hypochondriac. Oh, I'm sorry, hypo means below. 
<laughs> yeah, I'll take it back. I apologize. Hypochondriac below. So I guess this is below the cart cartilage. Neither one doesn't make really sense because you have cartilage here. I don't think, well, yeah, over here, right, cartilage. So yeah, you, you think, yeah, it's right. It's kind of below the cartilage, not completely below. Right, so it's a below the cartilage, hypochondriac, hypochondriac. Epigastric means, epi means on top, so it's on top of your digestive organs. So kind of gastric is your belly, so it's on top of it. So hypochondriac, epigastric, hypochondriac, right lumbar, left lumbar, umbilical, right iliac, left iliac, and this is hypogastric. Hypo means below, so it's below your digestive system, kind of. However, you do have still lots of digestive organs uh, here, small intestine, large intestine. But if you look uh, at this location of the organs, now you can be more specific, right? Um, however, you guys are going to a medical field, many of you, please study these quadrants. Um, I'm not going to ask you about these abdominal pelvic uh, regions. Uh, it's just good to know. Right? Um, so we talked about closed ventral body cavities, right? Remember thoracic and abdominal pelvic. We talk about dorsal closed body cavities, cranial and vertebral. Now, here are some other cavities. Many of them are open body cavities. So those are open body cavities, oral and digestive. Yeah, you can be surprised. Your digestive cavity is open body cavity because it has actually two openings. It has your mouth, that's one opening, and your anus, it's another opening. Actually, your digestive cavity goes from your mouth to your anus. It's continuous too. Digestive cavity is not closed. It's open to environment. And that's why it does not have this serous membrane. It has a different membrane. It's called mucosa. And we will talk about it later. But right now, pay attention. Digestive cavity is open body cavity. Nasal cavity is open. Orbital cavities are open. Middle ear cavities are open. So neither one of these has serous membrane. We also have cavities that are not exposed to environment, but they also don't have serous memory. And those are synovial cavities. And synovial cavities are your joint cavities that will be discussed later. Okay, I think this might be our last slide. Yes, it is. So uh, we done with our first chapter that is introduction to human body. Uh, thank you for watching and I hope it was helpful.